Let's uh, go ahead and start with a word of prayer before we jump into our message for today. Bow your heads with me. Dear loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for that, all that you do for us. We thank you for this Sabbath day, even though it's not very beautiful outside, we still have your Sabbath day of rest, and we can still enjoy that, and we thank you for this day of rest. We ask that you just be with us um, during this message. Open our hearts and minds to your, to your word, and help us walk away, have learned something new about your word. I ask that my words not be my own, but yours, Lord. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Okay. So I have a picture for you guys. You might recognize it. Last time I asked you, what is this building? What is it? The Leaning Tower of Pisa. And why does it lean? It's built on sandy foundation. And so it is started to lean. Why is it relevant to the message today? It's to show us that we must build our faith on firm foundations. And that is my goal for this series. It's called Pillars Are Firm Foundations. And last time, I, I asked you guys, what were the five pillars of Adventism? Can you, can you list the five pillars of Adventism? Sanctuary, Sabbath, Second Coming, State of the Dead. I know it's, it, it, it's really easy to get four, but then you're like, what's that other one? Spirit of Prophecy. Exactly. Those are the five pillars. And by the time I'm done with this series, I, I really hope that when anyone ever asks you, what are the, the, the five pillars of Adventism, you'll be able to list them off uh, Pretty, pretty fast. And do you remember which one we covered last month? Very important one. The Sabbath. And so let's, let's go to our text for today. And we're going to find out which one we're going to be covering today. Matthew 7. We're going to read verses 15 through 20. Matthew 7. 15 through 20, and give me a, a good amen when you get there. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Is everyone, everyone there? I don't hear the turning of pages anymore. Let's read it. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Be beware of false prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. What's Jesus saying here? What does he mean by, by their fruits you will know them? Have you ever heard of the phrase, fruits of your labor? So if any of you garden, you, you probably know that a fruit is the product of a flower. So uh, we have some zucchini and, and other squash in our backyard. And there's a flower that blooms first, and then, then the zucchini grows from the flower. And this is to, the plant uses this as a mechanism to, to spread the seeds around. And so the fruits of your labor, that's what you do, whether it's good or bad. And so this is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is warning us that there will come people who will try to lead us astray. And by their actions, by their fruits, we'll be able to tell whether they are for or against God. And throughout 
Jesus' entire ministry, he gives his disciples warning after warning after warning. And the disciples don't always heed his warnings, let alone even understand what they mean. And so they're, they're all, a lot of times we can see them, the disciples, being very puzzled by the teachings of Jesus. And it wasn't until his death that they um, started filling in the blanks. They, they started to understand what Jesus was meaning. Jesus, in this instance, was warning us about false prophets that may come. They'll look like sheep, but they'll be ravenous wolves. And we'll be able to know that by their actions. And so it is so important for us to have a firm foundation with our faith so that we will know who is for and who is against God. So we can weed out the false prophets from our garden of truth. So let's start with our, our first question. What is the purpose of prophecy? We have, to, we have to answer a few questions about this before we can really understand prophecy and the spirit of prophecy. The root word that prophet comes from means to speak for or speak forth. So by definition, what is the role of a prophet? It's to communicate with God's people. It is long gone are the days when Adam and Eve got to converse directly with God, walking with him, talking with him in the garden. But Adam and Eve sinned, and so we no longer have that convenience. And something that we need to note is that prophets are God's mouthpiece. They're, they're not just the predictors of the future. E even though they do have predictions for the future, that's not just what they do. And something that's very, very important is that you cannot wake up one morning and say, well, I think I want to be a prophet. I think I'm going to be a prophet. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be a prophet today. That's not how it works. God chooses you. And a lot of people who claim to be prophets um, are just self-proclaimed prophets. And the thing is, a lot of people prepare themselves by um, smoking or ingesting questionable substances to have a specific experience. And the thing is, a true prophet of God doesn't prepare themselves at all. Next slide. Right here is the, a, a picture of the ruins of the Oracle of Delphi. This is in northern Greece. And are any of you familiar with what the Oracle of Delphi did? So it was someone who would sit in this temple. It was, it was normally a woman. Would sit in this temple and vapors would come through cracks in the foundation from deep in the earth, and it would get them high. And then they would start prophesying. And so we know this is definitely not a true prophet of God. We know that they do not prepare themselves at all. Next slide. And this is a, it's kind of dark, but this is an artist's, artist's um, rendition of, of what the, the oracle looked like, and people would come visit, and, and she would uh, prophesy. Next, next slide. So how does God speak to his prophets? And I'm sure you've heard the word inspiration, correct? Even, even if you don't fully understand what it means, I'm sure you've heard of it. And this is how God speaks to his prophets and the writers of the Bible. And something that we need to note here is, is inspiration. This is very important. Inspiration is not dictation. It's not dictation. God's prophets were so much more than just his pen, his writing utensil. Rather, God conveyed ideas to the prophets, and then the prophets 
would write it down in their own words. Of course, it was what God wanted. It's not like they were writing what they wanted, want their, their own um, interpretation or anything. They, they wrote what God wanted them to write. And so they were his mouthpiece, not his court reporters. And we can see this when, when, when you compare different prophets in the Bible. You can see their personality coming through. And so God wanted us to take, uh, wanted his prophets to take a little bit more responsibility in the writing of his word than just merely his pen. After all, Jesus, if, if God wanted um, to have prophecy or, or the Bible written verbatim, Jesus, for 30 some years, what was he doing? He was building, he was a, a, a carpenter or I, I, I would say that he was a stonemason. We looked, I've mentioned that in a previous sermon. So God did not want the writers of his word to be merely writing utensils, but he wanted them to take an active role in the plan of salvation. And that's, that's what the real amazing part about it is. Because God could have very easily said, here it is, verbatim, write this down exactly. And I'm sure there, there were some places in, from the Bible that he did have them do that. Uh, the Ten Commandments he wrote with his own finger, and, and that was definitely verbatim. But Jesus, the God wanted us to take an active role in redemption, and so that's why the prophets had a little bit more leeway. But when we think of prophets, we think back to the Old Testament, right? We think back to the Old Testament time with the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah, but we don't often think of prophets in the New Testament, right? They're not mentioned, there's not books dedicated to those authors. So what function did the prophetic gift play in the New Testament church? Because it definitely, definitely did play a role in the New Testament church. Ephesians 20, uh, Ephesians rather, 2 verse 20. It says, built on the foundation of the what? Apostles and, and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. So the prophets helped with the foundations of the Christian church. Next one, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4. But the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their what? Their strengthening and encouraging and their comfort. So the prophets strengthened, encouraged, and comforted people during hard times in the New Testament church. Acts eleven twenty seven through 30. During this time, some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. The disciples, as each one was able decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So what else did they do? They predicted future calamities so that they could prepare themselves. And in this instance, they, they predicted an approaching famine and so they could get ready. And I think back to the story of Joseph. That's what, what Joseph did. He predicted seven years of plenty before seven years of, of famine. Acts 15, 32. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to what? Encourage, and this is the key, strengthen the believers. So just like we have conflict today, disagreements today in the church, they had those back then, and that's what the prophets also did. They confirmed their faith in times of 
controversy. So if there was a question, God would speak to his prophets and, and they would say, hey guys, this is what God says. And, and hopefully it went smoothly and people would agree, okay, this is the will of God. So what did they do? They helped with the foundations of the church. They helped strengthen, encourage and comfort the people warn of future difficulties and confirm the faith in times of controversy. So I would say that they were very, very instrumental in the foundations of the Christian church. But what role did they play in the post-New Testament church? They played an important role in the Old Testament, right? We have seen that they played an important role in the New Testament, but what about now? What about after the New Testament church? The thing is that the gift of prophecy did not stop with the times of the New Testament. There were many false prophets and true prophets that would come. And the thing is many false prophets came along with a movement called Gnosticism. Has anyone heard of Gnosticism before? So it's a... I'm trying to remember... When they came about, it was, it was after the first century A.D. that Gnosticism came up. And, and the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, or knowledge. And so they claimed to have this secret knowledge. And what they would do is they, they sometimes secretly meet in caves and claim they have some new knowledge. And, and they even penned um, some, in their minds, addition quote-unquote, additions to the Bible. Have you ever heard of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas? Those are all Gnostic Gospels, and of course, they are not in our Bible. They are, as I know, not in any Bible, even, even um, Bibles that include the Apocrypha, uh, Catholic Bibles. Um, I believe they're not even in there. And so Gnostics were heretics, and of course their, their books were all burned. And, and I'm sure they had lots and lots of false prophets during that time. But there's one really notable prophet about a thousand years later. Next slide. His name was Nostradamus. Has anyone heard of Nostradamus before? There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there about Nostradamus. And so Nostradamus um, did some writing. And, and um, when, you, when you do a little bit of research into him, um, there's, there's a lot of TV shows on History Channel saying, oh, Nostradamus this, Nostradamus that. But if you do some research, you, could, you figure out really quick that he was a false prophet through and through. He was a complete quack. And so if you do a little bit of research, basically he started off as a self-proclaimed plague doctor. So that he was alive during the Black Plague, and he survived the Black Plague when his, his family, his wife and children, died of the Black Plague. And so he believed that since he was spared from the Black Plague, God had spared him from this because God was going to use him to find the cure. And so he was going to find the cure. And that, that didn't work out very well for him. So he started writing almanacs. And he wasn't very good at it. And he didn't sell very many almanacs at all. No one, no one bought his stuff. Until he started to get better and better. He, what he would do is he would write about specific, like very, very specific things. Instead of before, he was being very, very vague. But he, he discovered if he wrote on... Uh, not just one year at a time, but if he just didn't put any time stamp, basically, on it, that people started buying it more. And as human beings, we like order out of chaos, correct? And so people would read his almanacs, and, and their brains would say, well, hey, this sounds like this, or it sounds, sounds like this. And so these almanacs, his writings, that's where all the conspiracy theories come from. But he is definitely a false, false prophet. So there are many, many false prophets out there. 
Which brings us to our next question. Are prophets still part of God's plan? And this is something that is oftentimes overlooked. We see all the false prophets, but we forget that there will come true prophets. Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So there will be prophets in the last days. And we're often skeptical when, when a prophet comes up, which is a good thing. That's what Jesus tells us to do. We are often skeptical about prophets. But we are lucky because Jesus gives us, the, God gives us a test that each prophet has to pass before we can acknowledge them as true prophets. Next slide. So what is the test of a true prophet? We're going to go through this. Next slide. The first thing, does their message agree with the Bible? And we find that in Isaiah 8.20. I have it right here. Consult God's instructions and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. So if any part of their writings contradicts the Bible, they are not a true prophet. Next one. Do their predictions come true? Jeremiah 28, 9. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent from God only if his predictions come true. So they can't just say, oh, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. You can't, they are not a true prophet of God, because only God knows the future, right? Only God knows what is coming. The next test is Christ's incarnation recognized. 1 John 4, 2. Now, I know I'm going through this quickly, but um, there's a lot of stuff to cover. 1 John 4, 2. This is how you will recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So they need to recognize that Jesus came in the flesh. And then the last one, does the prophet bear good or bad fruit? That's from our, our scripture reading for today, Matthew seven sixteen. By their fruits, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You will know them by what they do. And there's something very important about these tests of a true prophet. They must meet every single last one of them. They have to meet every single one. And we may be tempted to say, well, they, they meet uh, two or three out of the four. Well, I mean, they must be got from God, right? Mm -mm. They have to meet every single last one. And we, we can't be fooled in the end days. And Jesus warns us about this. Next question. Does Ellen White stand the test of a true prophet? So, the first test. Does their message agree with the Bible? Well, let's turn to her writings. Great Controversy, page 593, that's chapter 37. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of the spirits of darkness. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the holy scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. I would say she passes this test because she says it right here. She says our, that scripture is our safeguard. And, and many times during her life, she, she even said, hey guys, if my message does not agree with the Bible, 
She said, throw my message out and go with the Bible. So most definitely, she most definitely passes the first test. What about the next test? Do their predictions come true? And I have two examples here. So we have from Life Sketches, page 412. So Ellen White writes this in 1902. Remember these dates. The dates are important. 1902, she writes, Not long hence these cities will suffer under the judgments of God. San Francisco and Oakland are becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord will visit them with wrath. So she wrote that in 1902. And then she writes this, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 92. On April 16th, remember this, this exact date, April 16th, 1906, she wrote this, During a vision at night, I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. So she wrote this April 16, 1906. Two days later, next slide, April 18th. 1906. Two days later, the San Francisco earthquake hit 7.9. And if you've ever seen pictures, this is, this is probably the best picture I could find. Um, but if you see any of the picture, it just destroyed San Francisco and Oakland. It just, the houses just completely crumbled. So I think, yeah, I think that points to it. And then, and then one more instance. Next slide. And I want, I want you, to, I want you to, to tell me what this sounds like. Late in, in late 1901, she writes this. On one occurrence when, the new, when I was in New York City, I was in the night seas and called upon to behold building rising story after story towards heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify their owners and their builders. Higher and still higher their buildings rose, and in them the most costly material was used. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Man looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made from pitch. The fire engines could not do anything to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate engines. What does this sound like to you? Next picture. Something that we remembered yesterday. I think, it, I think it sounds like that. So those are two instances. So does Ellen White pass this test? Did her predictions come true? Most definitely. I would say most definitely they came true. The next test in, is Christ's incarnation recognized? The thing is, Ellen White wrote a very, I think it's her most popular work. It's called The Desire of Ages. What is The Desire of Ages all about? It's all, it, it's all about Jesus. Every single bit of that book is completely all about Jesus. Jesus. So does she pass this test? Most definitely. Most definitely she passes this test. And we come to the last test. Does she bear good or bad fruit? What do you guys think? Did she bear good or bad fruit? I mean, her writings are still changing people's lives today. She is the most, I believe, I believe she is the most translated female author in history. She saved, she's, she's changing lives. She helped people her whole life. She, she took the, back, uh, the clothes off of her own back and gave it to people. She would cut up her carpet to, to, to make clothing or, or whatever. I, I don't remember the exact story. She, uh, with, without her, we wouldn't have Avondale College in Australia. Did you know um, when she was sent to Australia, I, I like to call this time her exile. Because what a lot of people don't know is the reason why she went to Australia is because people didn't like what she was saying. 
She was speaking the truth. She was preaching what God was telling her to preach, and they didn't like it. So they sent her on a missionary journey to Australia. But I call it, I call it her exile. And she did, even, even though this was, in my words, quote, unquote, her exile, she did so much good there in Australia, so, so much good. And kind of funny, they, they wanted her back, and they had a hard time getting her back because she's saying, I'm doing God's, God's work over here. And so eventually she did come back. So does Ellen White pass all the tests of a true prophet? Most definitely, 100%. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that she definitely, 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 she definitely passes the tests of a true prophet. So today, my message, it's, it's not about Ellen White. I'm not trying to make a ca- the case that Ellen White is a true prophet. I don't think I have to make the case. I mean, her life makes the case for her. And the thing is, she wasn't the first prophet, and she won't be the last. Who knows, there could be someone right now sitting in this room or even watching online that God will use as his mouthpiece in the end times. That's kind of crazy to think about. Someone sitting in this room could be used by God as his mouthpiece. And the thing is, if God calls you to do that, you better not say no. If God calls you, you go. There's a lesser known fact about Ellen White. She wasn't the first one to have these same visions. Did you know that? Did you know that there were two men that came before her? The first man received the visions and he didn't want to do anything about it. And so the Spirit of God left him and went to another man. And this man was too scared to say anything. And so the Spirit of God left him and went into a young crippled woman named Ellen Harmon. The thing is, she did not stay quiet. They couldn't keep her quiet. They, They tried to silence her, and it did not work. So if God chooses you to be his prophet, don't be like the, the first two men, right? Don't be like them and stay quiet. Share his message with the entire world. But the thing is, if you don't receive the gift of prophecy, don't worry. There's a lot of spiritual gifts that God will bless us with. And the thing is, each and every one of us has a spiritual gift. God has given every single one of us a gift. And the thing is, it's, it's only a matter of realizing what our gifts are. So there in the back on the table, before you guys leave, before you wrap up, before you leave, there are some spiritual gift assessments. I have a few copies back there for physical copies. I want everyone, if you have not already taken a spiritual gift assessment, to take that. I also have a QR code back there that you can scan it and get a digital copy. Um, Also, the email I sent out um, last night to all the church members has a link in that. And so I challenge you this week to take that spiritual gift assessment. I'm reminded of the parable of the foolish servant who hid his talent in the ground, right? There was three servants. And they're the one that received the least took it and hid it in the ground because he was scared. When the master came home, what happened? He got in big trouble, right? He got in big trouble. The master took the one talent away from that man and gave it to one of the other men who had done something with that talent. We need to be like the two wise men, the wise servants who invested that talent and cultivated that talent. We all have a talent. And if we don't use it for the glory of God, guess what's going to happen? We're going to lose it. God will take it away. So I encourage you, find, find out what your spiritual gift is and put it to good 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you that you have given us your Bible and this this test of a true prophet that we can uh, know who is from you and, and in the end times not be tricked. I ask that you please be with us as we leave this place today, as we go out into this quite literally dark world, smoky world right now. Help us to use our talents for you, Lord. We ask that you please bless us during this week. Help us to minister to people we come in contact at school, at work, at the grocery store, wherever it may be. Just just be with us and help us to, to reach out to these people, to share your love with them. Uh, all of this I ask in your name. Amen.